looking for very individualized, personalized appeals based on a relationship. Now, how do you do that when you've got 16,000 employees and Lord knows how many customers? How do you take this kind of a philosophy, which we know fits the reality of the world, and how do you bring it down to the activities of the organization? Well, looks like that's the challenge. So let's dive in and see what we know about this. First of all, we know, for starters, that people are absolutely over-communicated just at the beginning. Is there anybody that came to this meeting that did not leave on your desk a pile of incoming communications and a pile of outgoing communications? There is. I'd really like to see your hand. What I'd really like to see is your desk. <laughs> you, it's a safe question, isn't it? I, I knew what your answer would be. How did this happen? Could it be any of us in this room bear any responsibility for this over-communication? Did anybody here send out any communication yesterday that really maybe wasn't going to motivate, modify, or reinforce somebody's behavior, but it just kind of seemed like a good thing to do, or we've always done it, or hey, you know, it's a newsletter time, right? Newsletter's got to come out on Monday. Get it out. You wouldn't do that. Well, other people are causing this problem, but let's us take a look at it anyway. How bad is over-communication? I want to I really impress this point on you, if I can, because we all talk about over-communication. We know we've got piles, but I don't think we understand just how bad it is. The advertising agencies in North America got together last year and, and did a study. They found that in terms of simple messages that we get, of course, in written and graphic and numeric forms, the average North American resident gets 5,400 of those every day. 5,400 messages. Now, that means you see a, a trademark, you see an exit sign, but your mind, your perceptual system is bombarded with 5,400 messages every single day. The proof of how difficult it is to break through the clutter is probably that wonderful direct mail industry. You know, the rule in direct mail today, and some of you may do direct mail from time to time, the rule in direct mail, and by the way, I consider internal messages to employees direct mail, because that's what it is, it's direct mail, and sometimes I think today it gets treated the same way as the stuff in the mailbox at home. The rule, of course, is that you have to get the idea across between the mailbox and the bucket. That's why you look at direct mail today, you notice everything is on the outside of the envelope. They don't even need to stuff anything in there, because it's all right on the outside. The first thing is that we need to find a real way of super-targeting the folks we want to talk to. Because when I and others, you yourself probably, when you investigate over communication, and if you look at your own stuff that you really didn't need to get, what's happened is that someone has just sent it to the list. Or has, again, gone back to the old days of messages like this. Just cover everybody just in case. Now I know Xerox is partly to blame, but you can't blame them entirely. The fact is, Super-targeting is not only essential in order to break through the clutter, but it's also essential to build relationships, because we need to know who exactly do we want to build relationships with. Now, this brings up a concept that uh, you may or may not agree with, but let me share it with you anyway. The concept of super-targeting not only talks about getting just to those people who really need to know, it also, of course, means leaving out those who don't need to know. Now, that's a rather interesting professional decision, is who to leave out without being hierarchical or dictatorial about it, who really needs the information and can do something about it, and who doesn't. But it also takes into account the realities of how human societies work, whether it's the organization as a human family or whether it's those outside publics that we have to get to. And that is a simple fact 
that despite all our rhetoric about democracies and everyone having a voice, we have just incontrovertible evidence today that on any single topic, 90% of the people who might care don't. 90% of the people who might care don't. In other words, we're talking about 10% of any group that really is going to be interested in the subject and in doing something about the subject. And I'm not talking now about just those audiences of thousands and millions out there. I'm talking even about a work group in an organization. That in other words, we as a society, through over-communication, through over-organization, through just simple over-busyness, over-specialization, have come back to the point where the opinion leader reigns supreme. The opinion leader is the person who is interested, who cares about this particular subject. I, I'm not describing now a stereotyped individual. This is a subject by subject thing. Is the person who cares, is interested, who is trusted and respected by his or her peers, and who will, if we can super target them, build a relationship with them, who will then spread the message, spread the appeal, and be a role model for behavior to the rest of that public. Now this sounds terribly undemocratic, doesn't it? I mean, it really does if you stop to think about it. We're going to find out those people who the others really listen to and really follow, and we're going to super target them because overcommunication just gets worse if we send it to everybody and let this sort it out by itself. It sounds undemocratic. The simple fact is that it has to be that way. Can you imagine what would happen, what would really happen if everybody in a community really cared about an issue and did something about it? Can you imagine the chaos, the incredible, unmanageable chaos that would occur? The reason that we operate our society and our organizations around opinion leaders is that very reason, that our interests are fragmented, and those people who care about the subject, we have licensed them to be the ones who will look into it for us and kind of report back and show us their feelings on it. After all, we're always free to reject the opinion leaders. It's just that we don't often do it. So the first thing is, do you know two things? Who are the opinion leaders inside the organization and who are the opinion leaders in the critical publics outside the organization? And have you got a list of them? And do you keep book on them? Do you know how they feel now about your product, your service, your rates, whatever? Do you contact them? Because notice what's happened all of a sudden. When we get down to talking about verifiable opinion leaders, people that we know, the rest of the group, have said, yeah, they're, they're the ones we look to. Now we can build relationships, because now from this, we've gone to this in a way that we can do something about it. Because we can find those people. We can find the 10%. And we can actually talk to them and build a relationship with them. I'll talk about some programs in a minute where we actually visit these people on a somewhat regular basis. Now notice what has happened once we've done that. We have now invited these people inside the organization, at least in a theoretical sense, and they are participating in our decisions that might otherwise affect their lives. Well, isn't that about the ideal way to build trust and to motivate behaviors so that these people will confer success upon us? It sounds like it to me. And so when I talk about the changes that have occurred, don't think that it's hopeless. In fact, you might take what Marshall McLuhan said. Remember, McLuhan said the medium is the message. Today, I think you might say the manager is the medium. And anything that is contrary to the manager being the medium is not going to be able to internally build the relationships that are necessary in order to get the job done. Now, who is going to train and motivate all of these supervisors, and I'm using that term for everybody from the CEO down to the first level supervisor. Well, it's clear, isn't it? That's the job today of the human resource personnel 
of the public affairs personnel, so that what we have is a kind of an interesting, an interesting system in an organization that the managers really are these relationship builders and that the professionals over here are really the facilitators and not the doers. But that makes sense, doesn't it? People cannot have that kind of confidence in specialists. And human resources and quality people and public relations people are specialists. They need to get it direct from their supervisor. Now that raises some interesting questions. Because now we're asking supervisors to do something that has never been popular with them. That, that the re by the way, the same research that shows that the supervisor is always the number one source, desired source of information, that same research shows us that the number one actual source of research of, of communication always is the grapevine. In other words, it's just the inverse. At the bottom of the list of desired sources is always grapevine, and at the top of the list of where do you get your information and build your relationship with the organization, the grapevine then rises to the top. Clearly, we've got a challenge there. How can we do something about this challenge? Or better yet, what can we do about this challenge? Well, in this new world of personalized relationships, a number of techniques are being developed. And let me share some of these techniques with you, because I hope you'll say, gee, we're already doing that. But if you aren't, at least let me share what some other people are doing. As we realize that personalized relationships to the opinion leaders, the ones who make things happen in the world, that that's, that's where the action is, then we can start thinking about some of these techniques. The first technique that really came on the scene is the customer satisfaction model. I don't know if you have a customer satisfaction model for your company, but let me just describe how uh, it's being done in a number of organizations. Uh, uh, one of the largest banks in North America, for example, does this. We'll take a branch bank, just as an example. The people in the branch bank, some evening or Saturday morning or over a brown bag lunch or whatever, get together and out of their experience, they draft a model that they think delivers customer satisfaction. In other words, these are the specific behaviors that if they take, the customers will be satisfied. Now, in order to do that, you have to first have some good discussion about what is satisfaction to a customer. It's a, it's a good exercise anyway, because it helps us all get that focus on those outsiders that have to confer success. And so they come up with their model of what they think delivers customer satisfaction. Then we bring in an assortment of customers to the branch, and we show them our model, and as soon as they stop laughing, they correct it and make what they as customers think is the customer satisfaction model. And then, of course, we blend those two models until both those who have to deliver the satisfaction and those who hope to receive it agree on what customer satisfaction is. And then we turn that into a very specific list of behaviors. Your quality program undoubtedly is doing this. You know, it starts with the simple stuff. The phone should never ring more than three times in this department. And of course, the next couple of issues of the employee newsletter have all those wonderful pictures of somebody flying over two desks, you know, to grab the phone before that fourth ring. The kind of funny things that build these into the culture but as you move down to the more sophisticated activities, two things start to happen. First of all, it doesn't take managers anymore looking over people's shoulders about delivering customer satisfaction because that branch personnel are monitoring one another on delivering customer satisfaction, particularly when we, deliver, when we build a customer satisfaction index and research into their bonus plan. Immediately, we start getting customer satisfaction. In fact, you know, just to show that entrepreneurial spirit is everywhere today, in one of the, one of the branches of this particular bank, one of the behaviors that they, both sides agreed, was customer satisfaction was that when the customer left the teller window or the banker's desk or whatever, that they would be smiling. So some guy in one of the departments somewhere else started publishing these weekly tip sheets of one-liners so just when your customer would leave your window,